Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Elvira Jangani Ose. I'm the curator of Basilea, a credit time project commissioned by our Basel to uh, offer today and this entire week, where we in fact have been here since May the 23rd, um, a conversation um, around the awareness of being a citizen in an urban space uh, and what that could mean. Um, and it's exciting for me to sit in one of our, in our second conversation, but part of this change that we're having, not only with artists Lara Marsegui, Recetas Urbanas and Isabel Luis that are part of Basilea, but also with experts and um, members of the intellectual community that have decided to join us to reflect, uh, to observe and expand some of the ideas that are embedded in, um, in this particular case, in Almarsi's work. Um, it is a pleasure for me to um, introduce this session <laughs> um, on wastelands and mineral rights, in which we have a mentor, Emily Scott Manuel Hertz, and is going to be moderated by Lara herself. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to let her uh, introduce the talk and the speakers. You have information on who they are, what they do, um, on our website, creativetime.org. Uh, just to say that it's extremely exciting to have the chance to have you here. Um, if you want, we're going to have an extended conversation with Anne Minton. Anna, Anna. Ha Anna, sorry. Look at me. I don't know what's happening with me in this trip and all the names are a real mess. It's probably because I'm traveling through time and space. Um, Anna, excuse me, uh, uh, apologies. So Anna Minton is going to be with us later on. So if you want to join us for um, extending this conversation at three, please let us know uh, um, at the end of this talk and, uh, and we'll take it from there. But without further ado, I want to um, as you in uh, joining me in welcoming Anna, Emily, Emmanuel with Lara. Thank you. Well, hello. Thanks uh, everyone for coming here. Uh, today I want to address the question of land, or let's say uh, grounds. Um, I think uh, land is very important to understand how the city is constructed, how the city is developed. The question on uh, what forces are pushing certain areas to be constructed in a certain way, uh, the questions on uh, how things are built as they are, why certain things are not built, and mainly the question on who owns land, who is the owner of land, and uh, for whom uh, the city is built. Uh, another second question, uh, a little bit more forgotten, even than land and grounds that I want to address, is the question on uh, what lies below the land, what lies below the ground, and who owns it. Uh, that's, this is the question on uh, mineral rights and the ownership of the resources that lay below the city and the ground, and what happened with them. Uh, I spent uh, many, many years of my work uh, looking at uh, construction and development, standing against architecture, architectural design, construction, uh, and studying against developers. And lately I realized that actually what architects do is to land in terms of destruction is really very small compared with what mining companies does. So actually mining the extraction, not of these little things for the telephone that you see so often in the newspaper, but just the extraction of um, aggregates for the production of construction materials gravel, sand, uh, um, stones for concrete is enormous, it's an enormous uh, um, destruction and I, I think it's uh, a very urgent uh, and very forgotten question I would like to discuss today. So our speakers, uh, Anna Minton, I really admire the way we have one of her books, I quite admire the way she is going into a lot of details about who owns uh, the ground how ground gets uh, uh, privatized, privatized in the herbal ground control, and then more lately how uh, uh, buildings are demolished and people are evicted, and how buildings are, areas are being used as investment uh, for developers. Uh, Manuel, uh, an architect from Basel, uh, probably one of the first persons I meet uh, ever in Basel, 
we had a very enlightening conversation where he explained me uh, in front of a map how everything that is dirty and polluting and extracting and nasty in Basel happened uh, outside Basel, outside the frontier in France and Germany. And this vision, which for you people in Basel might be very uh, evident, it was very uh, shocking and enlightening. And uh, well, we had uh, quite an exchange uh, on our positions on wasteland uh, construction architecture. Emily uh, is uh, very close to me in uh, her uh, vision. Her, she's part, uh, she's a researcher, a scholar, but she's part of a group of artists, uh, World of Matter, looking at the uh, resources in a world-wide uh, uh, point of view. And she has quite a view for the underneath, um, the question of resources, and a view to the mineral rights and what lays below, and we really share this, uh, this interest. So, maybe. I feel like. Um, first, thanks so much to Lara and Elvira and the whole Creative Time team for um, hosting this conversation and inviting us here. It's a wonderful place to speak and part of a really uh, stimulating conversation series. I've been going to a lot of the talks in the last few days. It's been a high point for me at Art Basel, in fact. Um, uh, as Laura said, we've known each other a couple of years, um, and it's been very generative and inspiring for me to both know your work better over the last couple of years, and you personally, and to sort of start having conversations I hope we have for a long time to come. Um, Laura, when she invited us, she said that we should each speak five to ten minutes at the beginning, and uh, that we might talk about our own work. Um, although, of course, I think we also should reserve plenty of time to talk about Lara's work, which is probably why most of you are here. But I will say a few things um, up front about how my own work uh, for a long time now has connected to the topic of the wasteland and more recently to mineral rights. Um, so, uh, my dissertation, I studied contemporary history at UCLA, and my dissertation was called Wasteland. Uh, and I was looking at uh, land-based practices by artists in the 1960s in the United States. And um, I started with an interest in why was it that a handful of kind of vanguard artists at that period who were like sort of a batch of artists who were first, at least in the Western context, leaving the gallery museum space and heading outdoors to, to the field and engaging in kind of actual outdoor sites. Um, why was it that at least the artists I perceived as being rather critical had an attraction to these very degraded sites, post-industrial sites, polluted sites, um, desert, dry lake beds in the desert that at that point in the public imagination were very directly associated with atomic testing. So these places that were dump, uh, dumping grounds, quarries, um, these types of kind of liminal or uh, wasted spaces, you could say. And what, what were the reasons for that? One of the reasons, um, I think, was that many of these artists were interested in um, resisting or pushing against romantic ideals of nature and scenic approaches to nature. And so um, one of my conclusions was that you know, they, um, these artists, which include many people, Robert Smithson being probably the best known or the most obvious protagonist in this crew, but there were others as well, and women artists too. Um, but. Um, to, to go to nature or landscape, not as an escape, but to go to landscape as a way to confront the contemporary and kind of the paradoxes and complexities of the present. So landscape then becomes a marker of the present rather than kind of a space to escape the present. Um, and I do think there's a lot of interesting resonance between Lada's work and Robert Smithson's in particular, which I'm sure many art historians point to this immediately. Um, more recently, um, my work sort of since the dissertation has really pretty squarely focused on contemporary art practices that deal with space and environment, and more specifically spatial politics and environmental politics. Often this kind of work is associated with social practice or socially engaged art, or more specifically what uh, Jane Randell has called critical spatial practices. And I think differently from the 1960s, um, I think artists today still are very attracted, and architects too, to kind of wastelands, or what has been called since the 90s, um, thanks to Solo Morales, the Tehran Vag. There remains a kind of attraction to these sites, but for somewhat different reasons. Um, and I think part of that is that um, a lot of artists who are take, taking up the politics of space today, these days, their work is really focused on 
the rampant privatization and financialization of space and also of earth um, in recent decades tied to kind of late capitalism, neoliberal capitalism. And um, so in this moment, the, the Tehran Vag or the wasteland um, maybe holds a slightly different, there's a different layer now, and just a couple of thoughts about the wasteland today. Um, I think that it represents, um, in a way, a rupture in the fabric of the kind of hyper-designed urban space. It's sort of when you encounter, for instance, an empty lot that's overgrown with weeds or that provides a kind of space of green in the midst of a you know, kind of concrete asphalt landscape, there's some kind of rupture that occurs. It, it, they, these spaces that you refer to as wastelands, and I think that's a term we can discuss further, but um, you know, often re represent a kind of um, a moment when a space is not in circulation. It's a bit out of time, or it's a, a period that's sort of um, a, a respite from market circulation. So it's either post-design or pre-design. Certainly it could be a site of financial speculation, but I think artists are attracted to these sites because it also could be a site of potential kind of resistance that would symbolize how we might imagine urban space otherwise. So for imagination or kind of experimentation, these can be really interesting sites. Um, in my own work as a site-specific artist, um, I have worked on um, public space, not in the collective world of matter so much as a different collective called the LA Urban Rangers. And I won't say much about it except to say that um, we did a program on empty lots in LA, one of our first projects where we built a campfire in an empty lot near downtown LA and just gathered people together to kind of explore this particular empty lot, which was very briefly empty and to talk about the kind of meaning of empty lots in the context of that city at that moment. Um, maybe if I have time to say a couple of words about this piece, or should I save it and move on, <laughs> come back later. Okay, so, um, and we can talk more about the financialization of the underground and mineral rights, I hope too, which is a, a part of my interest in her work. Um, so, two quick observations may be obvious about this gravel pit, or this, excuse me, gravel pile that you have assembled here. Um, I just, I was so pleased. This morning I woke up and the first thing I, I thought of is I remembered this great quote from the artist Matthew Coolidge, who founded the Center for Land Use Interpretation in LA. It's, a, it's uh, for every pit there is a pot, no, for every pile there is a pit. So um, two things that I think this gesture does. I think one is that it automatically um, when taken in consideration with this guide, um, it, it uh, suggests that geography is relational. So this comes from somewhere, this material, and it forces us to think about the relationship between this pile and the pits that are around Zurich at these gravel pile, or around Basel, these gravel uh, pits, these quarries. And then the second thing um, would be just the way that, um, again, it's sort of a rupture in the fabric of the city, and particularly, I think, seeing that geologic material, this kind of base primary material up against this shiny uh, skyscraper and the stark architecture behind me um, is a very powerful uh, way to kind of shift us to think about a very different register about how all buildings, all architecture, all urban spaces are built out of stuff. And this stuff has histories and it has geographies to it. And so it helps to kind of insert this other register into a very kind of hyper-human and hyper-designed space. Um. Yeah, thank you, Emily. That's really fascinating and links with so many themes that I think about in my work as well. So thank you very much to Lara for inviting me. Um, it's really nice to be here with these really interesting um, thinkers. So just to tell you very briefly a little bit about me. Um, my background is in journalism. 25 years ago, I started as a journalist and I kind of found myself here, unexpectedly in some ways. Um, I got fed up with journalism, partly because of the sort of pressures to write certain things in certain ways, the sort of pressures on time, and, and the impossibility of doing proper, real, meaningful work. 
So I moved into more in-depth uh, writing uh, about issues that really sort of I found of interest. And I, I wrote a report about gated communities uh, and ghettos. And then I wrote a report about the privatization of public space. I sort of fell into this area. And that's actually when I first met Lara. I think that was in 2005, so really quite a long time ago. And out of that came my first book, Ground Control, which very much looked at the privatization of public space, um, the segregation of the city, who owns the city, and Ground Control's subtitle uh, is Fear and Happiness in the 21st Century City. So the impact that actually has on our emotional and internal lives. And I think the link between the themes that Lara's really interested in and the themes I'm really interested in is that, you know, I'm talking a lot about the privatization and financialization of space. And when I look to solutions, and towards the end of ground control in the final chapter, I look to solutions, and it's all about wastelands. And it's all about free space, and space that operates outside of the market. And so it was really interesting to hear you, Emily, talk about the Turan bag, and you know what all of these spaces um, bring. But also it, it reminded me of the, of the internal emotional themes that I was also concerned with about the way individuals respond to those places and how actually those places are uh, a means for young people in particular to experiment in areas which aren't controlled and very rigid and actually it's a, this is Kevin Lynch who you know obviously I'm sure you know um, you know he said um, you know, these spaces are very often a, a, a way for young people to achieve mastery and to experiment. And actually what the privatization of city space has done, particularly in the UK where it's much more of a phenomenon than it is in continental Europe, but also very much in the US, is that it's created these huge, sterile, highly controlled spaces which are above all retail, consumer environments. Um, they, they are homogenized places where there's just no room for that kind of experimentation. And that has a real impact on our ability to handle risk and on our fear of the outside world and how to cope with, with risk in the outside world. So just to move on to the work I've done more recently, that's taken on the work I've done about the privatization and financialization of city space to look at the housing crisis in the UK and London in particular, but in the context of the global housing crisis, which is affecting a great many cities in North America, Europe, uh, around the world. And what we've seen happen, for any of you who know London, is the extreme financialization of land and property in London. I mean, really, really extreme where, you know, house prices in London have risen by 500% uh, in the last five years. At the same time as the profits of the main property developers have also risen by 500%. Rents are extortionate. The majority of the population uh, pay more than rent privately, pay more than 50% of their income in rent. Actually, uh, according to research in this area, if you pay more than 30% of your income in rent, that will lead to mental health problems. So again, you know, I'm always very interested in how, you know, this affects us and our mental health and our sort of inner emotional states. But um, again, it sort of seems to link back into Lara's work and into what you, you were just talking about. Geography is relational. And actually, we were discussing last night um, one of the aspects of this extreme wealth which has flooded into London since the financial crisis. That's why I called the book Big Capital. Um, one of the aspects of this is that in the super expensive parts of London, the sort of so called alpha territories, you know, places like Kensington and Chelsea, St John's Wood that these sort of super prime hotspots or the golden postcodes by estate agents 
one of the sort of signifiers of these places are what's called iceberg basements. I don't know if any of you have heard of the iceberg basements. And they're called iceberg basements because you'll just see a sort of, a, a probably a little structure at, like a sort of the top of an iceberg outside a sort of beautiful, expensive Georgian home. Uh, <laughs> but underneath, there is, there is like perhaps a two or three story basement being excavated, which, and apparently there are now almost 5,000 of these, according to a new piece of research, uh, which uh, has been covered quite a bit in The Guardian. Uh, swimming pools, uh, uh, home cinemas, even an artificial beach in one of these places. And they are, all, they are all over these extremely expensive parts of London. But the link, to come back to this, is that apparently the amount of basement excavation that has taken place is equivalent to 50 shards. So shard being the tallest building in London at present. So just imagine on the London skyline, 50 shards. Now that would have caused an outcry, you know, total outrage. But this is invisible. And so, I mean, it is very controversial. It's actually foundations have destabilized huge neighborhood disputes. It's not popular, but not in the same way, I don't think, as if it was on the skyline. So it's like, you know, the material is displaced, but actually we, we, we don't see it. So I thought this was a very sort of telling example, just as with your quarries. And, you know, I think the sort of one of the main points we're trying to make is we're trying to say this material has been displaced, here it is. But you know, all the all the material which is being displaced underground for this extreme financialization, actually we're not seeing it. I wonder where it's going. Anyway, so there's lots more I could talk about in terms of uh, capital in London, the property economy, why we're in this state, why we're driven by the property economy, but I think I've sort of laid out the link between, you know, our our work. So I'll probably leave it there. Thanks. Thank you. Well, um, thank you, um, thank you, Lara, for for inviting me here for this fa fascinating panel, and thank you, Emily and Anna, for your <coughs> contributions. It'll be hard to kind of match them. Um, I'll speak from a, a vantage point of a practitioner. I'm an architect. I, I, I'm one of these who makes these, I love this quote, who makes these piles and, and uh, produces a whole lot of shit and pits and stuff uh, while doing that. Um, so allow me, even though we, um, we, when we got to know each other, Lara, we spoke about Basel, allow me to speak maybe about uh, one, one and a half projects that don't uh, that are not cited here, we can bring Basel back into the conversation a little bit later on. Because um, the two terms that feature so prominently in, in this uh, title of this talk, mineral rights and wasteland, relate very much to a specific uh, work that I've been doing with uh, refugees <coughs> for the last 10, 12 years in the Western Sahara. The Western Sahara is the kind of a former Spanish colony on the western edge of the African continent. Um, colonized until 1975 uh, when on Franco's uh, deathbed he made a gentleman's agreement for uh, Morocco and Mauritania to take over the country uh, when the last Spanish soldier had, had uh, left uh, the Western Sahara. And one of the mot motivations for especially Morocco to invade uh, was exactly minerals, uh, was exactly the presence of phosphate. Uh, it's one of the phosphate which just regions on this planet, uh, so uh, it, it's exactly these kinds of, well this is not phosphate, but this kind of digging stuff on the ground um, that has, uh, it might look like just dirty stuff, but it's incredibly valuable and motivates uh, the occupation of a whole country, uh, in this case the Western Sahara, and the um, original local population had to flee into Algeria and has been living in refugee camps uh, for the last 40, 43 years. And <clears throat> without kind of misquoting Giorgio Agamben, we can of course kind of see these uh, uh, camps 
or it's often, these camps are often seen as, as kind of quasi wastelands uh, that are just there for waiting, that are very desperate, um, that have nothing in terms of resources. Um, but the amazing thing that the refugees uh, did, uh, the uh, Sahrawis, was to turn this wasteland not into flourishing land, but to turn it into a political project. Uh, to use the borrowed land that uh, they are living in in Algeria um, to kind of invest, to, to experiment with new social forms and political forms of self-representation. And this is really brilliant. Um, and they built the refugee camps themselves without exterior help. And um, uh, they are also there because, and that's another kind of stuff underneath the ground, um, because there's a bubble of water, <coughs> even though, though it's the most inhospitable region on this planet, 50, 55 degrees in the summer. Um, there's a bubble of water that keeps them alive, basically. Uh, but they developed a kind of a political, quasi-utopian system of self-representation that kind of prepares them for the moment that their return could be possible, return to the Western Sahara. Mm. And um, I've documented this and analyzed this uh, with the refugees, the, the kind of settlements and the political structure. <coughs> and uh, then we did a national pavilion of the Western Sahara at the Venice Biennale two years ago where we gave a kind of a national presence and we used this so iconic uh, institution of the national pavilion uh, that is so iconic for Venice or for the Venice Biennale as a kind of political agency as a uh, where architecture becomes not only representational or where these pavilions not only become representational but where they kind of demand a political status for a nation that doesn't have access to its own territory um, and Stepping out a little bit, maybe that's how I like to see my architectural practice. Um, of course, I build buildings, uh, um, but maybe to understand the practice of architecture also as a form of research, uh, uh, where not, of course, you need to kind of learn stuff to build a building, but also where the implementation of the building itself triggers reactions, triggers uh, a kind of a momentum. Um, uh, exposes uh, things and, and really kind of demands a reaction that um, you can only find out through this kind of architectural practice. So while, while, while doing a national pavilion of a nation that is not recognized in Venice, uh, what kind of conflict did it, uh, the, the foreign minister of Italy called Alejandro Avena and said that this has to be taken down and, and so on. This, this, uh, what do we do with the, how do we represent this? And, and uh, we were weaving carpets, uh, they were shown at the MoMA. How do we turn the MoMA into a kind of a tool of, of um, also projecting this kind of call for nationhood? Um, and uh, so uh, this question of, of, and I see it somehow also in your work, uh, of, of how this artistic or architectural practice can be a form of, of research um, into something that you can only find out actually doing it. Uh, and maybe if I have time for a little anecdote, do I? Yeah, two minutes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, where this maybe also comes to the foreground, I was uh, asked, I was invited uh, exactly a year ago to participate in a, a competition for a, a hospital in, in eastern Senegal, in Tambacunda. Uh, and it was, uh, uh, we asked you to, uh, to participate in this competition. It's, uh, you won't earn any money with it, but it's very honorary, honorable, and, and it's a hospital, and all that. Um, and I responded uh, with saying, like, uh, this is fantastic, it's a topic I love, it's a region that I've traveled to many times, I'm very invest invested in this, um, I'm very fascinated, and it's very honorable, but I will decline, uh, because I think um, it's not good that 10 architects, I was one of 10, uh, in Basel, in New York, in London, in Berlin, and so on, are inventing solutions for a region that they've never been to, a client that they don't know, for doctors that they have never met, uh, for patients that they've never spoken to. Uh, and I think the competitive format is not the right form. It uh, needs to be a collaborative format, and only then we can develop a good response. Um, it has to come through research. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the, the foundation that uh, had invited me was so impressed with my response that they canceled the competition and, and gave me the project, uh, which was, uh, was of course very, very nice. Um, and then I, I went there for two weeks and, and did a, a kind of a research before. Do you do a, I don't know, I don't know the 
auditorium on pillars in, a, in, in the martial arts, you can just say no to it, you know? Just, so you're my hero in that. Totally, to, it's wonderful, amazing. And then, um, so this brings me with another question I had for Emily, which was the question of activism, maybe more related with art. How much can we really, uh, how much artists can produce change uh, really in a land and land politics, if we can, which is not. I'm not sure if that's an unanswerable question, but I, I tend to be a bit of, I, I can both be extremely pessimistic about this kind of moment we live in, certainly, but um, also optimistic about the, um, the power of art to defamiliarize or make things strange or sensitize us in new ways to how we might think about space or become aware of the degree to which space is controlled um, and to, I mean, it's kind of a cliche, but to kind of make visible or attune us to things which are otherwise invisible. So a lot of the work that I most uh, am most excited about and most invested in writing about or participating in is very um, oriented towards social justice and environmental justice. So um, in that sense, there's a very strong link to activism and to a kind of fundamental belief in the power of art or the aesthetic representation itself to kind of um, create change. Um, but I heard a really good panel, I'm not gonna remember who said it, but uh, maybe it was Lava, um, the former director of the Queen's Museum. Mm -hmm. I won't pronounce her last name, Rick of it. Mm -hmm. um, something about how, it, I'm not sure it was her, about how artists are very nuanced and complex thinkers. Mm -hmm. And so they often can help um, at least evoke the complexity in a situation. So, um, to this topic of kind of making visible, you know, often like your wasteland guides draw our attention to places that are out of view. So you redirect our gaze to places that were previously kind of either invisible, often actually invisible, because they're probably also sometimes highly secured, so you couldn't even go to them if you wanted to, um, but, but they're kind of off of our radar. So we live in a city, but we're not aware of the places that the city is built out of. Um, that links also to the underground. The subterranean is a space that's like sort of literally out of view. And I'm gonna kind of now um, move towards Anna with the question, which isn't so much about activism, but I was just thinking when you spoke about these um, iceberg basins about the correlation to um, the phenomenon in the US of fracking as a technology of extreme extraction, which is now so, it's a kind of very dispersed form of extraction that also becomes integrated into residential spaces. So often you would have a fracking pad and a kind of um, well that's like in someone's front or backyard. Um, and the, a corporation would own leasing rights to kind of the space underneath a house. So that would be an interesting project, I think, to kind of, um, look at the links between these kind of extreme forms of excavation and extraction, which both, I think, are expressions of the same logic of um, extreme extraction. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, very uh, good point. And we are well aware of fracking. Fracking has come to the UK, and it's a source of huge contention. Um, there are various sites which have been uh, like designated for fracking. In fact, my partner's parents are massively involved in an anti-fracking campaign in North Yorkshire. You know, they're quite elderly, but they're part of the sort of, you know, we will not be doing, we will be locked on by activists. Um, but I think there is a really, really important link, not just the sort of subterranean, sort of destabilizing of the underground, which, you know, both are you know severely damaging to what lies beneath but it's actually the democratic process because fracking is hugely unpopular um you know local councils have basically said we don't want fracking here and if the local council said we're not giving planning permission you know that's the democratic process but essentially the planning system has been redesigned over the last few years to remove those democratic levers and fracking is effectively being imposed on certain areas. So there's a link between the total lack of democracy that fracking is imposing and the lack of democracy over many of the developments that I cover 
in big capital, um, which are being imposed on communities. And which, because I'm very aware of the fracking issue, right? I've discussed actually quite a lot. So you're completely right to point that out. Um, I mean, one issue I really wanted to pick up on also um, was with regard to Manuel, what you were saying about displacement, and and, and I also want to pick up on the refusal issue, but. Displacement, you know, clearly in, 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 in your work and um, in your work is such a huge issue with regard to communities being displaced over, you know, access to, to mineral rights. And displacement has been such an enormous issue in London because what we've started to see over the last 10 years is the demolition of actually hundreds of housing estates, estates of public housing to be replaced by these luxury apartment uh, developments with communities being displaced uh, as a result. And we have got to this stage where a lot of architects, you know, have no wish to be part of this, but, you know, they need jobs, they need to feed their families, all sorts of things like that. And similarly, artists who are constantly co-opted by big developers to provide you know, nice projects, kind of art washing type projects to give the sort of pattern of hipsterness and coolness. Um, you know, what, what do you do? Well, I think exactly, you're completely right, Lara. You've just refused and you've just shown, you know, that that can actually reap dividends. So great, you know, it's really nice to have some positive aspect to this discussion. <laughs> Lara, do you want to talk to us about your mineral rights work, your recent work? Yeah. Thank you. I cannot wait to tell you about it. <laughs> it's a project uh, that I am really uh, very excited about because it was very difficult to realize it, but somehow in the art world there's not a big attention for it, and Emily is very interested in it, so something that really joins me with her. Mineral rights, uh, you know what mineral rights are by now. It means uh, that you can buy a piece of land, you can buy a building, but you cannot buy the underneath uh, the building, the resources, they belong to the government, our governments, our states, in, in Europe at least. But our governments are selling the mineral rights to mining companies. That means that you might live in a city, a flat, or a farm, and a company owns below you, for example, Rotterdam is owned by Shell, and there are different companies owning below Basel for salt and below Berlin. Depends which neighborhood you live in Berlin, you might have a company owning below your flat or not. That depends on the, on the street and the area. Based on that, what I did, um, my interest to fight against architecture and construction, very fascinated by iron as a construction material, I acquired the mineral rights of an iron deposit uh, in Norway. So I, I got a square kilometer, uh, so one kilometer by one kilometer by one kilometer surface of mineral rights. That means I don't own the land, I own the resources, the iron below the land. And the mineral rights are um, uh, till the middle of the earth. So it's really very, very deep. <laughs> and they are exclusive, so no one can have them. Shell cannot have them, as a Lormital cannot have them. You cannot make a building with my iron, so I protect them. That's the project is very invisible, but it is, uh, well, it is there. It, it, the iron is really there near, near Oslo. It's, it's blocked. It's, um, protected. And uh, yeah, that's where I am uh, heading uh, for at this moment. So a project like that's interesting for a few reasons, I think. One is it does link to activism pretty strongly in the sense that there are activists now that are um, pulling together kind of resources to, well, they're pulling together financial resources to kind of keep oil in the ground, let's say, to prevent uh, kind of extraction in the location. So that gesture of um, holding some, creating a hole um, in the market, withholding something from the market. I think that gesture is very central to what you're doing, which is really interesting to you. That's a form of resistance, so you protect that material for an amount of time. But of course, the larger point of the project is not a straightforward activism about this particular uh, bit of iron, but to draw our attention to the much broader kind of um, situation of the kind of ground beneath our very feet being sold off to kind of mining companies and other industries and corporations. And I think it's also an interesting project in terms of, uh, in art historical terms, in terms of institutional critique. But the institution you're taking on, I mean, it's sort of a lot of different institutions, but it's an intervention into 
kind of system that draws our attention to the power that that system is kind of exerting. So. Maybe it's also a good point to um, bring in your installation here and its uh, relevance uh, actually to the city and, and how super site specific it is, uh, which is really why I, I like it so much. Um, the first time that we did meet, um, we, we were speaking about these gravel pits and, and what is maybe not known to everybody, but um, gravel is one of the economies of the city of Basel um, next to not only art, uh, but also of course the farmer. Uh, or the bio, um, uh, biochemist, uh, chemist, chem biochemical industry, and and uh, uh, because of the Rhine, uh, we have a lot of gravel, and and uh, we excavate it, and uh, because of the limitation of the canton, it's uh, the city itself, and the canton is just 30 square kilometers. Um, this is a very contested, of course. Um, activity because it, it um, modulates the ground, it shifts the ground, it shape, reshapes the ground, uh, and it, it uh, has a huge impact on architecture, urbanism, recreation, and so on, um, which I think is very interesting for, for Switzerland uh, and the mentality, if, if I'm allowed to, as a non-Swiss, to speak about Swiss mentality, um, because um, somehow I, I think like the, one of the highest values in the Swiss mentality is stability. Um, like everything should be stable. Uh, transformation is generally very skeptical or, or, or seen very skeptical. And um, what, of course, uh, it shows is that uh, the, some of the major parts of the Basel economy is based on exactly the opposite, on tra slow transformation or sometimes quick transformation on the most fundamental thing that we have, which is the ground. Um, uh, and and uh, then we see how uh, the, uh, once it gets revitalized, once these pits are closed, um, uh, once they get transformed into park, uh, it's this kind of cloaking of stability or this kind of construction of stability which is very artificial, um, mm -hmm. but it looks supernatural uh, and romantic almost. And, and this is, I think, what you are uh, indicating and hinting at with your installation, which is uh, really kind of uh, op uh, touches the wound or the, this inner psyche of, of and especially of Basel, which is quite unique. Yeah, uh, thanks. Well, I, I just yeah, I came with several anecdotes of things we found in the, in the research, like a neighbor of a huge gravel pit in France, in San Luis, uh, mentioning that this kind of idea that all Basel is built with our gravel mm -hmm. so here in France or more, bring it to more contemporary because this was in the 70s, 80s, uh, uh, another gravel pit in Germany, in Bailen, where we realized that the area will be refilled with earth from excavation from the building of new uh, buildings in Basel. Mm -hmm. And then it will become agricultural land. But actually the agricultural land that will serve as agricultural land will be acquired by the, municip the municipality and different companies to use it as compensation land for other construction projects. So it's actually double uh, serving construction while uh, taking the, the earth uh, of the excavation and while giving uh, new possibilities to build uh, as compensation. So it's uh, rather uh, perverse actually. Uh, it's like three times of exploitation, I would say. I can't do well, no, the gravel, the construction, the earth. So it's uh, so actually we have four days of excavation here, so we should uh, triplicate that in terms of destruction. <laughs> So I, yeah, I was thinking, um, yeah, th this question I was telling you before we start talking, uh, who uh, takes the decisions in, in Basel, in Lamp, uh, maybe a case or in general, I know it's a big question. Um, maybe, okay, okay, Basel is very much shaped by this limitation of space. Um, and Basel is growing, and immediately as you grow, you hit the border. Now, if you go 500 meters in this direction, you come to France or to Germany or to another canton, uh, and and this has a huge impact on how we build and, and where do we build. Uh, um, and then, of course, we have the economy. We have Novartis and Roche as uh, gigantic players, and they also own a lot of land. Um, and they develop them. You have the Novartis campus, uh, campus, the Roche campus. 
Uh, and the Novartis campus is a gigantic gated community um, that is somehow taken out, literally physically taken out of, of uh, kind of public space. You can't access it, uh, even though it's gigantic. Um, but also the rules are different. So the planning code, uh, the, uh, the governance of this area is different. So one could almost speak of a certain kind of informality, privatization informality it doesn't stick to the formal rules that we usually have. Um, with, even though it's super corporate, there's a sense of informality, um, not, not low um, level or low income informality, but super high income informality in that, uh, which I find quite interesting. Uh, so we have these two gigantic players and some others, um, a big foundation uh, that owns a lot of land. But we also have, um, let's say, uh, there was a vote, uh, uh, a referendum, and if I, I hope I'm not um, kind of misquoting that, but a referendum whether the city is allowed to sell off land, and it was decided not to. Uh, so there is a momentum against privatization in the city that is very acute, very aware uh, of that. So it, it's, it's two forces at the same time. There's a city that owns really a hell of a lot of land uh, and that can control it, uh, what is happening there, and that is doing that very actively, but also two or three gigantic players who are, um, at, uh, the city is at the mercy of them. Now, if, if Novartis would leave, the city would be bankrupt. Everything would vanish here. Um, and, and that's, uh, it's a really a force of, yeah, it's a small city that is, um, monopolized in a way by two, three big players, and, and they know that they have that power. I have a question. Oh, yeah. Oh, you want to respond? I have a question, yeah. but it's not on this. So many pieces. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, I, I have a question, but just to say quickly, that's so, so interesting, because in London, in the UK, like every public body has to sell off all its land now. The NHS has to sell off its land in order to pay for hospitals. Transport for London has to sell off its land in order to pay for infrastructure, so yet more luxury apartments, like on all of this public land. And I keep quoting like Swiss innovations about how we can actually intervene in this process. So, you know, I will definitely uh, add this to my list of local figure in Basel. Um, but, you know, I wanted to ask you, Lara, actually, as well. Um, you know, we worked together in 2010 on your project in the Succession Gallery, where, um, you know, visually, uh, you, your uh, installation looked not dissimilar to, to this project, like there was, you know, there were piles of rubble inside the gallery, but that was quite different because actually those piles were the exact tonnage that had uh, been involved in the construction of that gallery. But I just wonder, you know, I know you've done a few projects like this, which sort of have some visual similarity, and you're looking at, you know, the materials that came from somewhere to go somewhere else, and you know what lies underground. When was your your first one? <laughs> My first one, uh, well, my first one was not a good one. It was uh, just a, a list of construction materials of a huge building in Brussels. I've been invited to do something in a building. And I was looking at a way to analyze that building, to understand it, but somehow destroy it and criticize it. So measuring all the construction materials was my strategy, to make a list of the materials and present it in the space. But then it looked like a little bit just numbers, a little bit abstract, also because I made a mistake to just put it on a paper. And then on my next show uh, in France with a water tower in a little village, I decided to really pile up the materials, but these were materials new. So I've done different projects, sometimes showing the materials uh, you would need to make a building, or sometimes showing the materials you would get if you demolish the building. That's what you get in, uh, in Vienna. And here the materials of extraction for quarry. So relating to before the building, after the building, or the production of extraction, it's all about putting uh, construction in pieces to study it. And precise. But it's also about confronting the public with the enormous, enormous scale of construction. Because someone would say that I'm a little bit uh, too big. 
things, do, I'm doing things like a red and large for an artist, a bit uh, megalon, megalomania or something, but if you see what we have around us, you know, there's a high rise, <laughs> that, and the parking, and that, it's a spin I mean, I just had a relation with uh, uh, some this nice temporary construction. I mean, uh, the scale of construction and architecture is enormous, it's unhuman, and uh, yeah, that's why I have to be big. Otherwise, I also like to do small things. It's not that I really <laughs> want to be that big, but this is, yeah. to be able to have a conversation yeah. with these people here, <laughs> I need that scale. But, but I, I, I think it's very much as you said, you know, it's not dressed up in any way to be made palatable. So while clearly it's not, you know, as big as, you know, the whole surround, it's also hard to deal with. Um, I, just since we're talking about architecture and what you maybe could call an architecture, like against architecture, um, I just remembered a very funny comment uh, an artist friend of mine in Chicago once said, um, a really brilliant artist, and she's like, I was telling her about a class I had been teaching at Eteha, which I've been a postdoc for five years in the architecture department there. And um, she's like, oh yeah, maybe I'd like to talk to you more because I really, I, I've just always hated architecture. Maybe you can help me start to understand what there is to like about architecture and I thought it was so funny because of course architecture is like the shelter that we live in it was such a broad statement but of course what she was getting at is this kind of inherent violence of architecture which is that it always imposes something right and so to come back to your kind of um, early description of your response to this brief for the hospital in uh, Senegal um, one reason I'd like to come back to it I really like um, the way you formulated almost this kind of ethic of architectural practice, which then gets very close to site-specific art. Because you would think that site-specific art um, is very close to architecture, which should be site-specific, but in fact, very little architecture is site-specific. And um, so I think this idea of um, a practice, whether it's art or architecture or activism otherwise, um, that's tied to context sensitivity and specificity is a really important point. And it, this kind of work is very slow. It takes a lot of time to kind of really um, understand and observe a place, to know how to respond in a way that's kind of appropriate, socially, environmentally, like but politically, in all sorts of ways. Um, and I think that, um, I'm wrapping up. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> it might all, it might, it might often end in a very modest kind of practice, but I, I talk to my students a lot about like how would you think about a form of design where it's not an imposition of something into space, but it's a kind of gesture that amplifies existing conditions or highlights something or makes visible things that are already there that we wouldn't otherwise see. And that's a very, um, I think, a potential of architecture, um, but not a often practiced one. Yeah, maybe um, two things. Uh, first of all, um, I hope not to kind of break the the myth, but uh, um, some of the projects that I'm doing, uh, you might find them deplorable also, because I also want to have the liberty not only to um, um, build in the in Eastern Senegal or work with refugees, but I also want to have the liberty to work with super rich clients and build a, I don't know, a fancy villa where one person occupies I don't know, 200 square meters or, or something. I, I, in the end, it's about architecture for me. Um, mm. uh, and an architectural quality that is fascinating. And, and yes, site-specific, absolutely. Uh, it's uh, everything has to be somehow so specific to where it is located, but that doesn't mean that it is um, kind of regional or, mm. or genus loci, um, or that it looks, um, it can be, very, a very foreign, strange looking object, but it's still super scientific. That's what I like to kind of play with. Um. Great. Now we have very brief time for some questions uh, from the public. This is completely something else in relation to what you talking about that was actually more deep, more interesting because we have this kind of political and social statement. But just 
talking about the work and in this context. How do you see this public work? So to whom it belongs now, now that it's here? Uh, I don't uh, really know what is going to happen with this work in terms of the public. For me, uh, in my projects, I think there is a lot of control and design in the city. So I try to do things that bring the information to the public, that question the city, the space, and then I let people use it in different ways. So for me, this I like guides. I know most people hate tourist guides. Me, I, I, I love guides because for me, a guide is a tool of information of what happens in the city or places that might be interesting. And then I go whenever I want, if I want, or maybe I, I don't know, but I know these sites exist. So how this is going to function, if you are going to take it and go there uh, tonight, I don't think, or tomorrow, or you leave it at home and your kids take it, I don't really know. And I, I think that's good. I think that that's good. But I don't know how the project uh, can produce a knowledge of a place that can produce certain action. But that's how I like that. I like to leave things new. So there is some information and some experience of the city, which is, uh, which, well, you know, there is, a, people know about the tourists of Basel, but we put, we put quite some information together, not just about the past, but also about the future plans. Mm -hmm. So there was kind of a heavy research. And then, uh, yeah, a lot of things can happen with these parks and these spaces and the public. And I'm not aiming to control it. Has because we need to wrap up to start the following session. I'm sorry that we have to cut this short. But we have, um, if you all want, we can continue the conversation here informally. And at three, if people please want to do it, please let us know because if you, if there is no quorum, we will just simply cancel. But if people want to share a little bit more of this conversation with us, Anna has offered to give us nowhere of her time to, um, to continue this conversation. I just want to say, that um, this is extremely uh, uh, insightful, um, both your comments, but I also uh, want to, to finish, and I, and I know we cannot talk about it in, uh, in the session because the activation of the square has to start, but, uh, but you are, you are an, uh, an artist, but you are also a citizen, and you found a way to aesthetically, but also to intervene in a space we live in. No? And I would like us, if you can all share with us, how can we as a citizens make that an impact? No? One was the vote, right, that we do democratically, that this vote that was recently, uh, uh, that recently occurred here, but also, you know, like, what are the other formulas that we can take? What are the places we can go? Who are the people we can talk to claim that we have awareness of the use they're doing or something that is part of who we are, where we live, and our rights as well? You know, with that note and that inquiry, I think I have to pass the mic to Isabel Lewis, but I ask you please stay and join us in a conversation. There is juice, there is water, that we're happy to share with everyone. Uh, and I hope you also continue the conversation with us tomorrow when um, at one we will have um, the last of this uh, conversation on Mesoplast, that as you know, are part of the Arbasa conversation. Um, one entitled Techno Techno Tech. Uh, moderated by Andrea Lisioni with Catherine Wood, Claire Tascon, and the Basilea artist Isabel Lewis. So until then, thank you so much, and uh, see you later.